Now we have our next session coming up and it's time for some more drums. And we've got one of the best in the world. In fact, he was named one of the 25 best drummers of all time. Our next session features Dave Weckl, a virtuoso drummer and modern drummer hall of fame inductee. Dave has an incredible list of recording and performing credits. I mean, it's just immense the number of people he's played with. Everybody from Simon and Garfunkel to George Benson, Robert Plant to Chick Corea, it just goes on and on and on. And for this session, Dave will be presenting a masterclass in drumming. This is gonna be awesome, check it out. Okay, are we on? Are we live? We are live? Hey, okay, cool. Hey everybody, Dave Weckl here, how you doing? I'm really happy to be here for uh, for Yamaha Drums and Sweetwater and uh, talking, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my gear since this is Gear Fest. Um, so uh, first of all, I hope everybody's doing okay out there. I hope um, this uh, this COVID-19 craziness is uh, is not too hard on everybody and and wishing those uh, that are affected to, to be well soon and, you know, and hope that we can all get through this and uh, get back to uh, playing some music. So I, for one, have been very busy in the studio teaching, um, doing a lot of teaching, a lot of playing and practicing. I figure it's a good time to, to uh, you know, stay positive and get, uh, get, a lot, get a lot of work done, basically. So um, I haven't had a haircut in a while. Sorry about that. But, um, you know, my wife is in Italy. She cuts my hair. So that's all that's about. So it is what it is. Um, let me talk a little bit about this gear because uh, the gear is everything. I'm, I'm going to be talking um, mostly about flow and getting around the kit with ease. Uh, it's a, I'm a big proponent of getting things set correctly so that can happen. As some of you may know, I play traditional grip most of the time, so my, my kit is set up to accommodate my, my uh, traditional position here. But these are the Yamaha Phoenix drums. Um, it's the Bentley of the drum set, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, incredible, incredible woods, four different woods in this drum set. Uh, I'm currently set up, because I was doing a bebop session, um, and I, so I have an 18-inch bass drum on this um, with a 10, 12, 14, and I have a 16 over here. Um, I've been putting floor toms on my left since I was a kid um, for no apparent reason other than I, I just like to have a melody voice over here. Um, <clears throat> using my, uh, my, my 30th anniversary signature snare drum, this is a brass shell, five and a half by 14 dual strainers, uh, really a special drum. All Sabian cymbals here. In fact, one of the things I'm gonna talk about is this new prototype flat ride that's coming out. Um, and Sweetwater's gonna have that. Yeah, so. 21 inches, it's kind of fitting into the legacy line here, uh, but with a little more hammering. We don't have a name for it yet, but, uh, but a 21 inch flat. So I'm gonna just play these a little bit so you can hear them, and, uh, and then we'll talk about, about stuff, okay. Okay, so that's that's a little little demo of uh, of the sounds that I got going here. I'm using Remo Clear Ambassadors on these drums, um, and I'm using uh, I've got Latin percussion bells here. I like to play a lot of Latin stuff, right? So again, once again, the gear uh, has a lot to do with uh, sometimes getting the music across and getting the things across that I want to play. So using these bells, right?
Okay, so not a little demo of that. Uh, let's see, what else am I using here? I got, uh, I've got Shure microphones uh, that I've always used. I'm using their Shure in-ear stuff. And um, Vic Firth, of course, Vic Firth sticks and brushes and all those kind of things. These are my signature sticks that are kind of wore out, actually. But uh, anyway, so flowing around the kit. That's, um, for me, like I said, the gear is important. And, um, you know, I do play traditional. However, sometimes I play uh, match grip. However, the snare drum, sorry about that. The snare drum is, uh, is not exactly set up for, for traditional. So for me, when we're talking about gear, again, it's very important that, um, that, I, that I'm able to adjust this thing quickly. So all I got to do is go down here move that and I'm, and I'm ready to go, right? So that makes it easy, right? When I'm changing this, got to show you this, this snare stand, okay? All right, sorry, I'm a little bit of a salesman here today because this snare stand, the SS850, or is this the 840, 850? I don't know, they're gonna kill me because I don't remember numbers, but, but this Yamaha snare stand is killer because it's got the ball socket here. Let's me adjust really fast between match grip setup. And when I want to go back to a traditional, I'm there, okay? Now, the reason that's important is because for me, when I'm trying to deal with, uh, with playing things on the kit and getting into a flow and getting into a place where I can, I can easily do things and get to the music so I'm not distracted by silly things like setups of snare drums being too low or tom-toms being angled the wrong way or think places where I have to reach. Um, you know, those, those things, I don't want to deal with that when I'm, when I'm trying to play a song. So the setup is really important. It kind of starts with the seat height and how high you are sitting. Uh, and for the traditional grip, you know, a lot of my studies came from Freddie Gruber and, and uh, so I'm a big proponent of of letting the sticks do a lot of the work. Okay, I'm playing from a middle of the middle of the hand fulcrum, so the uh, the priority and the kind of the vibe of this is always uh, in a pendulum type of effect. So I'm not holding on up here and doing this right. My my whole hand is doing this type of thing. In order for that to happen though, and the bounce, I need the clearance on my leg. So I can't be sitting too low. If my leg's up here, I'm going to hit it. That forces me to hold on to the stick, and then I push. I don't want to push. I want to let everything rebound and come up and out of the kit so things have to be high enough all over the kit for me to easily stay centered with my body, right, to get around this kit. Right, so if I'm too if I'm too low here with this drum, that causes my body to come out of position, and then I'm reaching. And you know, the older we get, we got to start taking care of body. Well, we should start a lot sooner than before it's too late, right? Body health is imperative to be able to play this instrument for a long time. And I have to say, for me, because of the because of the techniques that I learned from Freddie, with uh, this middle of the hand stuff. And, uh, and letting the sticks bounce a lot, letting, you know, be with control, of course, uh, has given me a whole lot of uh, ability. And I'm actually in better playing health now than I was 25 years ago. I used to tape my hands up and I was in all kinds of trouble with, with being out of position. But so many things as to whether you can do or cannot do something on the kit really comes down to setup and what your gear allows you to do to get things in a natural position so that when you're moving your body, you're not reaching, you're not pushing, and you're letting these sticks do the work, okay? So <clears throat> one exercise that I like to do around the kit is uh, hand and foot combination stuff, okay? And that those exercises kind of, uh, they're, they're designed to uh, propel and, and instigate spontaneous creativity instead of practicing specific licks. So this is one of the exercises that I have in my online school, which uh, and all of my teaching stuff, which you can go to my website, daveweckel.com and see all of that stuff there. But, but this exercise is based on 16th notes and, and it's basically just all around the kit in any, with any combination you can think of with 16th. So, so if we just take two and two, 
two hands, two feet, right? And we, and we do that all around the kit. We'll start with right, left foot. And the idea is to keep the hi-hat going so that we introduce some independence, okay? Because it's kind of easy to do this stuff where let's say it's easier to do this stuff without you know, the independence factor, okay? But the idea of this is to identify what you're doing with the time, okay? And of course, it's all about the time, right? So two and two, right? Right, left, foot, foot. Okay, so that's the basis. But you take that and you, you alternate. You alternate strokes with the right, left, Okay, you also invert all of these patterns. So instead of right, left, foot, we're gonna also do foot, foot, right, left, and then alternating. And then put the foot in the middle, right, foot, foot, left, right, or alternated. So here's the combination of all those, okay? Here we go. Now, the, so those were kind of all three of them in and out of one another, uh, and that's just one. You can do four hands, two feet, two hands, one foot. Those are all a combination of threes and sixes, so now you're gonna have a little bit of a polyrhythm going, right? If we did two hands and one foot with 16th notes, And then the combinations keep going. One hand, two foot, singles between the hands. So these are the basic foundational exercises of this, of this whole exercise, which then comes back to a master exercise of melody thinking, okay? Not sticking, not rudiments, not that approach. It's the approach of musical things, okay? So when I say singing, or when I'm saying uh, melody, what I'm talking about is the jazz history melody. You know, great players like you know, Michael Brecker, Randy Brecker, Freddie Hubbard, you know, Coltrane, the list goes on. But the guys that play really great melody stuff from a jazz culture with incredible time, these guys could play, can play with no rhythm section and you know exactly where the time is. It's just burning time and it's in time. So when I'm talking about drums and melody, I'm thinking about those kind of things, big bands, you know, horn section things, Latin type of horn section things, right? Things like that. I'm trying to play those kind of ideas instead of thinking about paradiddles or rudiments, then it becomes sounding like a marching event on a drum set, which for me, is not so much fun to listen to or to play. So I'm, I always try to come from the musical expressive side and play the melodies. So if you're thinking about that, boom, boom, bang, boom, ba -doo, ba -doo, ba -doo, ba -doo, ba and then you also incorporate the foot into those melodies, that's where the foundational exercise comes into play because you're not playing something specific. You're playing a spontaneous thing based on the melody and what you want to do with the stickings, not a specific sticking or a rudiment, so it's kind of reverse, right? So here's a here's an example, kind of, right? Okay? And it's not only, it's not only about uh, the drums as voices in the melody. You noticed I hit the cowbell a couple of times. I hit the, a cymbal, the splash stuff without, the, uh, without a bass drum or a snare drum. So in a jazz sense or in a soloistic sense when we're playing a solo or a fill even, uh, this approach could really be, can really be nice. So you can take this idea and play two bars a time and play two bars of fills with this concept of using the hand and foot combinations within a melody, okay? Like this.
And you notice there, I ended with the left hand on the cymbal, and that's not a big deal because I've practiced the foundation of alternating, and if it's not, it's not a problem if I come out with the left hand. And that's the point of the spontaneous foundational practice, so that you are prepared to be very spontaneous in the moment, and that's how I like to live on the drum set. I don't like to, to pre-plan things unless it's, part, unless it's part of a song that is a orchestration that kind of becomes, you know, part of a, a compositional aspect from, from the drum set. Okay, so that's kind of my approach with that whole thing, and that goes into to playing time, uh, you know, similar things with, with drums and melodies where, where time is concerned, right? When I'm playing in a linear fashion, in a contemporary beat, ex for example, something like this. Okay, so same kind of approach, all right? I'm playing, it's, it's kind of very linear what I was doing. In other words, kind of not a lot of things together, right? Everything was, was separate. But I was making a melody within the groove. So you could spice up your grooves that way. And again, you noticed how, how, uh, how nice it was to bring the left side, the left floor time in over here. So that's the other thing about your gear choices and what you do, you know, just because you see a drum set in a magazine or somebody else play it doesn't mean you need to set it up that way. If you've got ideas and thoughts about, you know, hey, I'd like to put some bongos over here, and which I used to do actually, um, you know, you could come up with a lot of creative uh, sounds because the melody changes based on where the gear is placed, okay? A lot of guys swap the high and the low tom-toms sometimes up here on the rack toms. You know, lots of different ideas to do. So, you know, make sure that you, uh, you know, you don't get into a habit of, of setting up or doing something just, just because, right? Think about how, what you want to say. And then the other side of this, you know, when we come, when we come into melody and creativeness and, and being able to play in time, I can't, I can't enforce the idea and the concept of how important it is to sing. And I mean singing drums, okay? Because you could practice this stuff away from the drum kit. You don't have to be on the kit to necessarily practice time and practice phrasings and practice those kind of things. Use your voice, okay? Anytime a song comes on, get your, get your foot going and sing. Because if you can sing... The, the rhythms, you know, it's the precision of rhythm that, that kind of separates the men from the boys, if it were, that I was always attracted to listening to great players like, like Mr. Steve Gadd and Peter Erskine and, you know, God, the, the list goes on of all the great players that, that schooled me when I was young and listening to the precision of the way that these folks play. And again, I mean, it's, it's obviously not only about that because it's about the touch, it's about the sound, the contrast of what's going on. And that's one of the reasons that I do play traditional grip is about the sound and about the contrast because uh, it's very easy to get up on the tip of the, of the stick this way, whereas with match grip, it's not so easy to get that sound. So demonstration would be this groove, right? As opposed to that same groove with traditional, Right, that tip is built in because I could just kind of go up into the traditional position and I'm up on the tip. So anyway, those are a few things, uh, you know, to think about here in a quick time. I don't think I've ever had to do a 25 minute clinic, so this is a record for me. <laughs> Usually I do about two hours. So I'm, how much time we got, guys? I don't know where I'm at. We're, let's, uh, what do we got? Let's uh, five and a half minutes. OK, cool. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to play, play a couple things here. Um, to demonstrate a little more of this flat ride and, and things like that, okay? This is a, this is a, a little excerpt, because flat rides are generally associated with jazz, and so I'll do a little thing that's, that was from a play along of mine a long time ago with Chick and John uh, Patitucci, 
And uh, just, to, just to let you hear it in context a little bit uh, with, uh, with this particular thing. So let me, let me go there on my Pro Tools and then this should work. Okay, so you kind of kind of get the idea of it in a in a jazz sense. Um, however, this this symbol can work in a lot of different areas. So it's not just about jazz. It works great for. I could play shuffles with this thing. The thing that's so special about this guy is that it's very dark. It's a dark sounding flat, which is, which is very, uh, very unusual. So uh, works especially well, of course, for lighter playing, which is the reason it was designed because of all the trio work I've started to do with Chick again. Uh, gotta play lighter, man. You gotta can't be big open strokes when you're playing with a piano trio. You gotta practice all your controlled stroke stuff, not letting go so that you're playing soft, right? Can't be, uh, can't be doing this type of stuff when the piano's six feet away with the lid open and big, nice big condenser mics in there. So practice your controlled strokes, practice your open strokes, and um, yeah, fluidity. I didn't get to talk much about molar technique, but that's a big one for me where fluidity and flow on the kid is concerned. Uh, so you can come on into my school and check all that out. We got a bunch of, bunch of info on that. Uh, uh, great technique course, groove courses, play-alongs, all kinds of things. So check out my website and, uh, and come on in and, and check it out. I wish we could do some questions here. I don't, I, don't, I don't think we can do that, right? We don't have time for that. That would be cool. But um, I don't think we can, can we? No? We're not set up for that, right? Don't think so. Okay. Yeah, that would be cool. I'd always love to interact with folks, yeah. Hey. Hey, Dave, how are you? I'm good, Mitch, how are you? Good, it's good to see you again. Yeah, likewise. It's been a while since you were out here to Sweetwater. Hope we can get you back soon when all this craziness is over. Man, it's been a while since I've been out to anywhere along with the rest of the planet, right? <laughs> that is, yeah, that I hope so. Yeah. I hope we, can, right, I hope right, we right. can do this in real time. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, right, absolutely. So we've got about a minute and a half, and man, I, I, th I think it'd be really cool if you just uh, kind of one of the questions that I think comes up a lot is how do you work on time and how do you work on groove? What do you recommend that somebody, you know, they really want to develop their time and get that locked in? How do they do that? Well, like I said, singing is a big part of it for me. I, I, I think that you have to internalize time and it has to at first be done against metronomic time so that you do have a reference. Um, a lot of the things that I play uh, you know, is either with a click track or with, it's with a track, so you have to play with something uh, and, you know, of course, subdividing and internalizing the time is important. So if there's a, a metronomic source, which we'll use this for now, for me, just being able to sing, precision, you know, um, it always helped me to have a metronome where I could adjust the, the, the subdivisions. I could actually bring them up and I could make them groove a little bit so you don't have 16s going bat, 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 right like that. 
uh, make the make the click groove, and then so when you put that to the drum set. You start you start honing in on those you know on that precision. The other thing what what I started doing later in my life because back in the 80s when we all had to play with drum machines or actually try to sound like one to get work, um, you know it, it was kind of a cerebral approach you know that 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 you know and so that approach kind of uh, inspires stiffness and it inspires you know um, you know like you're aiming for a bullseye or something it's got really nothing to do with the feel. So later, uh, later I learned that you know, to try to get more organic with the, with the feel. And the Muller technique is really, really helpful in making that happen because it's about the spatial uh, content of what goes on between the beats. So if you practice with a metronome, you get that time happening, but you work on trying to fill the spaces with flowing motions instead of stiff ones, right? It's a, bit, it's a big, big difference, right? So the flow, you know, this motion kind of naturally takes up that space. So it's kind of like you're walking down the street instead of aiming for the time, you know. And that was a, that was a big revelation for me, learning right. about how to try to become more natural, more organic, more relaxed with everything. And, and of course, this pendulum idea, middle of the hand, all that stuff plays into that whole aspect of relaxation. Uh, and kind of organic spatial stuff, all right? Right, so awesome. That's, that's the answer in a nutshell. That's incredible, and that's, uh, unfortunately, we only have time for the one question, but that was a great answer, and, and I think something there that uh, any musician can take away from, uh, from this, and not just drummers, obviously, specifically for drummers, but any musician can take that concept of organic time and that flow and all of that and apply that to their own playing. So thank you very much. That's very cool. Absolutely. My pleasure. All right, everybody, have fun out there and uh, get your stuff set up so you can hit it right, right? Don't set up too low. You miss your bounces. <laughs> there you okay. go. Thanks, hey, Dave. Be safe, everybody. That's uh, always enjoyable for me. Thanks a lot, Mitch, Sweetwater, everybody at, uh, there, and thanks, Yamaha, for ha getting me into this, and uh, be well, everybody. Right on. Take See care, ya. Dave. See ya. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye.